Okay, good morning, Heritage family. How's everybody doing? Good. Right off the bat, I want to start off with a little thing I call a, a kingdom exercise. So it's a repeat after me prayer, and I'll, I'll lead you in it, and you follow me. It's two questions, and I stole this from C.S. Lewis. Anybody know who C.S. Lewis is? Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe. He begins his day with these two questions, and I've, I've made it a practice since 2016 to start my day off like this. As soon as I walk into the kitchen, I get on my face. And why don't we pray together? Repeat after me. Lord, who is in control? And to whom shall I listen to today? Lord, thank you that you are in control. And thank you that I get to listen to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. That's kingdom stuff right there. That's kingdom living, kingdom focused, kingdom minded. And that in a world, like if my, my wife and I, Jeanette, uh, she's there with our, with our four kids. Uh, we joined the Heritage family uh, last summer, around, around July time frame. And our, our SOP, we move every three years. And so when we, we said when we're moving to California, we came from the East Coast, we said we're going to visit 10 places. And I was in the field when Jeanette came here for the first time, and then she, she just said, I found the place. And we've enjoyed every moment of this journey in 2020. And if I didn't believe in the sovereignty of God, 2020 would make no sense to me. Especially the journey we've been through here would make no sense. But because I believe in the complete sovereignty of God, not like he's a little bit sovereign, but because I believe he's completely sovereign, it all makes sense. He wants our attention. And so we're here saying, Lord, you have my attention, and we're, we're ready for the ride. So our journey began quickly. I was on, I was on a four-month deployment, and I came back, and my wife had signed me up for this thing here, this ministry at Heritage. It was January 11th, and uh, it was a, uh, a ministry that had four prophetic ministries. So there was four stations here. It was about 2.5 2 hours. And you'd walk in, and I'm, I'm, my wife knew I'm, I'm all in. Whatever it is, if God's there, I want to hear about it. So this is my, one of my first experiences at Heritage. And so there was four stations. There was prophetic uh, art. There was prophetic uh, prayer, prophetic healing up there. And then uh, uh, in, in, the, in the auditorium, there's a place where you can just pray. And, just in, and there was music in there and everything. First station. I sit down with, uh, with Harmony. She's right there. Right? And, and so prophetic art works like this. This is my first time doing something like this. The person, the artist would sit there and pray, God, what do you want, what do you want me to draw? And I'm sitting there in receive mode. And so as, as Harmony is, is drawing with, with watercolor at the very end, and I'm praying, I'm like, Lord, what are, what are you going to do here? This is, this is amazing. I don't know what you're going to do, but it's going to be awesome. I, I, I opened my eyes a little bit, and I saw what she drew. And I started to cry. You want to see what she drew? It's right here. That's right there. It was a tree, but it's not like normal tree that you would draw. It's a tree showing roots. Nobody draws trees like that, really. I mean, there's there's art, there's trees in our in in the auditorium there. There's trees. This is a very unique way. And I started crying. You know why? Well, if you back up, it's the same tree that God had given me in in a vision in 2014. Same one. I'll show you my journal from 2014. It was here. And as soon as I got this, I, it, was, it was a time in my life where the Lord was, was calling me to become a freedom fighter. My whole life, my, this is my life mission, to turn my ears into graves where people can bury their problems and begin healing. And this tree had everything to do with that. Like this thing it started to add, and everything I had on here, I actually stole it from the Bible and from a lot of smart people who wrote a lot of good books. Uh, there's, there's, there's portions. So over the years, this thing started to develop, but I knew at wh wh whatever, I was, whatever I was getting from God, it was that the spiritual invisible world down here is always linked to the physical visible world. Like everything we see, taste, touch, hear, smell, is always linked to the invisible world. They're inextricably linked. So that nothing happens up here that doesn't first originate from down here. You know what I mean? And so, so 
what I started to get was this picture like this is the heart. This is our human heart. This is this would be uh, the, the head. You know, like our brain has chemicals, dopamine, oxytocin, uh, serotonin, and you know, all those things. Okay? This is that physical body. And then here, by the time it gets up here, it's in our hands. It's, it's coming out of our mouth. But I, I knew that there was a relationship between this, and this was spiritual things. Spiritual warfare was doing this battle here. And then 2015, started to get more and more. So every time I'd open up my sketchbook, my journal, I was, I was adding to what I was learning about how God wants us to live in complete freedom. And uh, in 2000, so, so I, just all these roots here. And what it really was, I was working through my own life. I was like, okay, how am I behaving? Am I writing it down here? And what am I believing down here? And God had brought a lot of people into my life that were, that were gifted in, in, in handling scripture and in hearing from God. And one of the most influential people in my life was a guy who had never went to school for seminary or anything. He just hung out with Jesus all the time. And um, so I started to hear these things and see these things. And then 2016, uh, there's, there's that version. I uh, got these four core idols, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. But, but that every sin in our life, every single fruit, bad fruit here, was linked to four core idols. That's the worship of power, the worship of comfort, the worship of approval, and the worship of, of uh, control. And that's the one I really said, oh, that's the one. So those four, four core things, when, when I worship something that becomes an idol, an idol is taking something that was good and I've made it an ultimate thing that I believe I need. And now it's an unhealthy thing. Okay, so fast forward a few more years later, and then God gave me this, this, this vision for, for uh, bricks, four bricks that, that I was building on top of the soil so that becoming insulated and isolated. And so this brick, was being, brick wall was being uh, built on the ground so that my heart couldn't be exposed. And those, there were four bricks, guilt, anger, greed, and jealousy. I'm going to unpack that in a moment as well. So, and then let me, let me also read to you what happened that day. I, I, I journaled what happened at, at uh, that ministry. It's called the spa. But, so that was the first ministry, right? That was the first section was uh, the prophetic art section. I walk out of there, dry my tears, thinking that was amazing. And then the next station was a, was a prayer station. And uh, I, I, I walk into the room and there was four ladies sitting there. And the first thing I thought was, God, you're so funny. This is great because I had this evil theology before that you couldn't really minister to me unless you were the same gender. And that's ridiculous, right? But God had delivered me from that and he showed me his sense of humor by saying, watch this. So I walk into this room with four ladies there. They don't know me. I've never met them. I just got back from a deployment. And I wrote here, uh, the ladies, they started off the session, have you ever had prophetic prayer before? I answered uh, yes, but I was kind of reluctant. like, not really, but I, I think. They explained they had no other agenda but to listen to the voice of God and communicate what he was telling them. So it was silent for a minute. And the first lady to speak, I wrote Candace question mark. I, I forgot. Uh, she said, Ryan, I'm getting an image of a tree. And I was like, is this place wired? Are they listening to each other? <laughs> I couldn't believe what I was hearing, and another lady, and I put Sandy, question mark, and Sandy's right there. She said, I am seeing that tree as well, but I see that you are the tree and that you will provide shade for others to enjoy. So I've been reflecting on this tree for, for years, but I was getting more revelation through people who would listen to God and just communicate. They were just conduits, conduits of his, his truth. And Sandy looked at me, and she said, do you know where Trestles is? And I said, of course. I live there. Absolutely. I replied with joy. She told me to go down the Trestles Trail and find a mighty oak tree, her words. It was very special to her and her family. I gladly accepted her recommendation to visit it. She had no idea that I would be visiting the Mighty Oaks uh, Legacy Program the following week. It's, it's for uh, service members who are, are battling with PTS, post-traumatic stress. It was, a, it was a retreat, but they don't call it retreat, but it was a bunch of, of guys we're sitting in a room talking about their, their experience in combat and their experience with wounds in life. 
uh, all prophetic, right? And that was based off of Isaiah 61.3, that God will restore people to mighty oaks of righteousness. So after that, I looked at the ladies and I said, did, did you guys talk to the other stations? And they just all laughed. Like, no, we just listened to God. But it was new to me. And more and more, I'm finding out this is nothing for God. And I didn't share this at the last service, but I went home and my daughter, Giselle, who's, who's got a gift, I said, baby, uh, she's, she uh, was eight at the time. I was holding her hands. I said, I want you to draw what, what, what God is giving you right now. Guess what she drew? She drew a tree. She drew a tree. Okay, so here's a tree. Okay, I'm going to jump into this. Uh, Lejeune, if you could show this. Uh, 2020, so I wrote a book about it, okay? And the book costs free 90 free. It's about 143 pages because I believe that God's word is free and he wants to give out his truth to set people free. So this thing is free of charge. I'm um, still, still dialing it in. Um, 100% plagiarized from the Bible and from other people that, that I just thought were, were pretty awesome. So, so that book is available. Okay, here's, here's the tree illustration. Now I'm going to illustrate it by bringing up this thing here. I learned last time I got to go around the speaker. Okay. Nope. And I'm going to block it here. Okay, so here, here's how I'm going to illustrate it. Brian, can you see that? Is that good? Okay. Um, like I said before, the, the, the physical, visible world is linked to the invisible uh, spiritual world. The way we behave is always linked to what we believe. The passage that this is, that, that this is all based on is James 1.21. And in James 1.21, he, he, he gives what I call the gardening principle or, or a planting principle. James 1.21 says this, Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. If you're going to plant a tree, if you're going to plant a garden and it's going to be healthy, the first thing you need to do is what? Got to get rid of all the junk on the, on the ground. If you have something here and it's not bearing good fruit, well, the problem is not necessarily up here as much as it is, it is down here, okay? Uh, so this principle of, first, uh, of James 121 is you get rid of all this stuff and then you'll have good fruit. Now that is combined with another verse, 1 John 1, 9. And this one's etched on my soul because it's used so much. In fact, if you use 1 John 1, 9 as much as you should use it, this should be falling out of your Bible. If you know it, say it with me. There, uh, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Here's a little Bible study tip I like to do. If Put your finger on the word forgiveness, and you just say, what's the only action verb that precedes forgiveness? Because forgiveness is what we're after, right? I mean, who loves forgiveness? Who wants forgiveness? Yes. So put your finger on this word forgiveness and look at the only verb that precedes the word forgiveness. It is what? If we confess. If you look at the word in the original language for confess, it's the Greek word homo legeo. Homo legeo. You know what homo means? It means same. Legeo is to speak or say it. So homo legeo is literally same say. Say what happened. Say what you did. If you go before a judge, this is a legal term in the ancient world. It's not the judge is like, so how, so how do you feel right now? He doesn't care about that. She doesn't care about that. How do you plead is the case. So before God, before the court of God, he says, how do you plead? And it's this, but I did it. <laughs> That's exactly what I did. Homo legeo. Same say. And with that comes... Forgiveness and cleansing from how much unrighteousness? All. The kids are great. I taught this to a bunch of kids one time. And uh, this little girl named Alex, she goes, uh, Mr. Ryan, well, what if I confess sins on, on Monday, but then I forgot to mention the sins I did on Sunday. So what does God do with that? Right? This is amazing. Kids are so deep. Well, according to this passage, you confess sins. Now, this is inferring that I'm not going to confess something I'm not aware of. I'm confessing all the things I'm aware of, right? We can't sing a song we're not, we don't know. So we, this is saying, confess the sins that, that are on your heart, you're on your mind. And then cleansing from all unrighteousness. 
The problem is I can, I can be clean, and the next thing you know, I walk out into the world, and I stepped in a, another pile of you know what, okay? And then I, I go, oh, Lord, that's on me again. Thank you for your forgiveness. A life that's marked by confession and repentance is, is like this. Lord, I'm, I'm believing this. Thank you for your forgiveness. Notice, because of this, I did not ask God to forgive me. I confessed my sin, and then I thanked him for his forgiveness. That's got to be drilled over and over, like an athlete drilling his moves, dribbling a ball or whatever. It's going to take time to get that into your muscle memory. Now, now my kids are back there. If, you, if you're a parent, I mean, you're anybody, if you're a person, you're going to need to confess your sins. And sometimes I go like this, like especially my son back there, I go, oh, I just did the same thing like five minutes ago. I don't really want to confess. And the Lord's like, no, just do it. And then I get down on my knees to my kids and I say, Daddy messed up again. Yeah, I should not have said that. I should have not have done that. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your forgiveness. So your whole day is marked by, Lord, thank you. You're so gracious. Okay, so, so by that by way of introduction to this, to this tree here, okay, let's play a little game here. What do you think are some things that people struggle with? Okay, let me write it here. Like some sort of bad behavior. We're going to fill up this tree and then, and, then, and then dissect it and break it down. What are some things? Well, it's kind of quiet right now, so let me, let me do this. What do you think the person next to you is struggling with? <laughs> All right. But don't, don't be spouses. You can't be elbowing your, your spouse, you know. What, what are some things? Pride. And then, and then when someone's prideful, how are they acting? Yes, arrogant, uh, stubborn. Look at this. STDs, things they say, think, or do are so prideful, so hurtful, so arrogant. Where does that come from? Okay, what else? What are some other? Selfishness. Selfishness. All right. Yes, another fruit of something bad. These are all bad fruits. What, what are some other things that people struggle with? Jealousy, Jealousy yes. Jealous. Lust. See, this is easy when you start thinking about other people, right? <laughs> these, remember, these are other things people might be struggling with, okay? All right, let's make this real interesting. What's your spouse struggling with? Raise your hand. I'm just kidding. <laughs> what else? Anger. anger. And, and by anger, we really mean rage, right? Because, I mean, we're angry. We can be angry, but the Bible says don't sin. But here, rage. People angry about a lot of things today. A lot of things. Anger and rage and manifesting into breaking things and throwing things and tantrums. What else? Yeah, and when some bitterness. So when someone's bitter, how are they acting? Yeah, they're mis yeah, we'll just put miserable. There was a study on the top destructive behaviors in the DOD, in the Department of Defense. And what they came up with is, number one was suicide-related behavior. The number one destructive behavior in the military. The Department of Veteran Affairs has a statistic on their website that is staggering. If you look up 22 a day, right? September, you see people doing the 22 a day challenge. You know what that stands for? 22 veterans a day are suiciding taking their own lives a day. That does not account for unreported suicides and accidents that were really suicides. So the st statisticians tell us that that number of 22 a day is really 5 to 25% higher. And if we're being honest, it's probably higher than that. So suicide-related behavior. There's also, within the DOD, there is domestic violence. There's also sexual assault. There is also uh, substance abuse. There is also alcohol abuse. There is all sorts of manifested fruit. And what we want to do today is see what's at the bottom of this. So the very first root, I have seven core roots here. I'm just going to breeze right through it. If you want to look at Freedom Vision, the book, then it's, it's all there. First things first, the first root 
is the root, and I also have it up there. Yes, there you go. The root of deception. And the root of deception comes from the Garden of Eden. Uh, uh, Paul also talks about this in 1 Corinthians. But in the Garden, Eve was deceived. She was deceived. She was having a conversation with the enemy that she shouldn't have been having. And it also led to the second root here, rebellion. Who was the first person to rebel? Yes, yes. In the very first person, yes, was Eve. But, but, wait a minute, who got in trouble first? Adam. That's right. Why did he get in trouble? That's right. He was not deceived. He willfully rebelled. If you look at the passage, I love it. This is what I love about the Bible. You just read it, and it's, it's so clear. She was deceived. She bit this fruit, whatever it was, and she goes like this. Boom. And she gives it to him. It says it right there. She gave it to her husband who also ate. Adam's heart was re- such a rebellious nature, and Eve was deceived. He should have stepped in. How many, how many of you, you, you watch your spouse, and what's really going on on the outside is they are having a conversation with the enemy. And sometimes confession time here i'm like how dare you be attacked by the enemy when i should step in with prayer and with grace and with mercy and with peace because the enemy is trying to have a conversation with my spouse i mean so so many people who come in to the office and they're like i can't believe my spouse acts like this and i i and god gave me this picture of like what if you walked into your house and and someone was like choking out your wife in this jujitsu choke and you walked into the house and you saw someone choking her what would you do almost every guy in that base is like i'll kill that guy that's right what if it's the enemy what if the enemy's planning thoughts in your spouse's wife then where does your heart go does your heart break for them or because of them you see in if, if in spiritual warfare my heart doesn't break because of people it breaks for them so if i if someone's saying something mean or racist or maligning, then I know, wait a minute, they didn't come up with that. They got that from the enemy. My heart breaks for them. What's going on down here? Something I'm going to say over and over throughout this whole thing is the heart of every issue is the issue of the heart. Down here in the spiritual world is the heart. Up here is the physical world, the head, the hands, the tongue. The heart is is the thinking capacity of our being. It's the deepest part of our soul. In Matthew 15, 19, Jesus says, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. That's what defiles a person. It's the heart of every issue is the issue of the heart. Proverbs 4, 23, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. So when the Greeks have the word heart, it's used about 156 times in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the the Hebrew word lab, 860 times. But in 156 instances in the New Testament, it never refers to the physical blood pumping organ in your chest. You know what it refers to? The thinking capacity of your being, the deepest part of your soul, the heart. The cardia, you know what a cardiologist is? It's a doctor of the heart. So cardia is is what does your thinking. It's the decision making. Every issue I deal with, we deal with, we struggle with, is an issue of the heart. Where is my heart at the moment? And here's a prayer that God will always answer. Lord, what's the condition of my heart? What do I need to confess? And you might not like it, but God will give you the answer every time. And you'll know because he'll give you something you need to confess. And you're like, no, I wasn't talking about that. I'm not ready to go there, God. I've got a story about that later. So, so deception and rebellion are our roots. Here's another root that uh, if you look in the scriptures, it's called the love of what? The love of money. 
1 Corinthians 6.10 says that the love of money is the root of all evil. Some of your translations would say the root of, of some evil, but if you look in the original language, it's the root of all evil. Why? Because all, all that passage is talking about is idolatry. When my heart worships something more than God, it becomes an idol, and it's the root of all kinds of evil. So again, for uh, James 1.21 principle, I have to get rid of the, the evil roots here because they're manifesting into fruits here. Now these next four, these next four roots are, I, I, I took them from a guy named Pastor Tim Keller. From his, he wrote a book called Idols of the Heart. He talked about four core uh, idols in the heart that manifest in bad behavior. So here we have, and these are all, because an idol is something I worship or I, I elevate to an, an un unhealthy status. So the first idol root is the worship of comfort, the, uh, the worship of control, the worship of approval, and the worship of uh, power. There you go. Anybody struggle with uh, ha wanting to be right all the time, having to be right all the time? That's an idol. That's an idol of power. Uh, when there's when there are sexual assaults that happen, uh, when there's rapes that happen, uh, the, the psychologist tells us that that's not about sex. It's about power. It's a power thing. It's a power lust thing. So, but power also manifests into well, I need to say something. I need to be right. You uproot that by saying, I don't need to be right. <laughs> I don't have to fight for my way. Uh, the, the, the idol of approval, and I, when I talked to the kids this morning at the family service, um, it dawned on me that this thing doesn't go away. <laughs> Is anybody still today, as a grown adult, which I will be one day, uh, still struggle with the idol of approval? Doing things to gain the approval of others? You live for others instead of for God. If God is my approval, then I no, no, no longer need a pat on the back. My wife and I joke about this thing, uh, making coffee for God, right? So we make coffee for God, meaning, and I haven't done this in a while, so I, I confess and I'm repenting of my not making coffee for God lately. But if I made a cup of coffee and I made it for my wife, then I don't need a thank you from her. Why? Because I didn't make it for her. I made it for God. So after I make the cup of coffee, I go, God, were you, were you pleased with that? And he goes, right on. It's even French press, and it's the good stuff. So I'm really, I'm really pleased with you. I approve. If I have God's approval, I don't need anybody else's approval. I'm good. If Jeanette comes in, and she's like, ah, I don't even want coffee today. I'm not brokenhearted. I'm not hurt. And I'm not saying, oh, it was even the good stuff. You know, it was... It was local roasted from Sir Coffee down there. That's expensive. It was French prep. No, it's, all right, Lord, are you pleased? If I'm meeting with someone and they don't show up, I am still pleased. I'm still at peace because I did it for God. So this is, that's the, the idol of approval. I don't live for other people's approval. What about the idol of control? And this one just, this is the kind of root that just levels the playing field. Control is such an illusion and the more I think I know, the more I think I control. But that is an illusion. Um, I, I just did this thing recently where I, I don't, I, I, I deleted Surfline, all these apps, okay? I don't even check the surf report anymore because this is the control thing for me. I just pray. I look at the boards. And I'm like, Lord, let me read that one. And I just go. Um, I don't control, I don't try to control anything anymore. Um, when I'm frustrated with my kids, it goes back to a heart issue of control. Uh, any, uh, who's married in here? All right. Isn't marriage miserable <laughs> when I make it about me and I'm trying to control my spouse? But if I learn to die to myself, and what uh, Jared always encouraged me, hey, fall on the sword first, bro. Be the first person to fall on the sword. When I don't control, it can be beautiful. The more I try to control, the more miserable it is. Look at everybody on the news that's freaking out. They want control. 
Their idols are things of this earth. But people who live in freedom don't need a specific person to be in office because Jesus is on the throne. And last time I checked, uh, he, he won. He's there. Okay, and we, we, we live in a monarchy. We live, we live for a kingdom. We don't live for here. It doesn't matter to me for I serve a God who's completely in control. Nothing is out of his control, so I just celebrate all the time. And when I forget, like I did yesterday and the day before, I am in the, I'm in the routine of saying, I did it again. I worshiped control. Thank you for your forgiveness. See how, I, see how fast I went to it? Thank you for your forgiveness, Lord. What about comfort? Worshiping the God of comfort means I only do things that make me comfortable. Um, sitting down and confessing sin is not comfortable. It's not. But it's what God calls us to do because when he is our savior, then there is no more hiding. There is a tendency to live in emotional insulation and isolation. Do we know the difference? Emotional insulation is, uh, I'm going to let you know me, but you're not going to know me all the way. Emotional isolation is like, no one's even going to get to know me because I protect myself. So all of these roots underground are feeding this. Uh, and Nolan Powell sitting right here at, at the first service. He goes, yeah, and, and you have to get rid of all the roots because if you leave one, it's going to be a mess and it's gonna, they're going to grow back. How many roots can we afford in our lives? What if I got rid of six, but I left seven? I, I have to search my heart over and over every day and say, Lord, is there anything left there? And he will, I promise you, whether it's through people or speaking directly to you, he'll tell you what needs to be confessed. You're probably doing it right now. And what I would say is write it down in your heart, write it down in your soul, write it physically on a paper, piece of paper and say, this ends today. My story of being known, um, the Lord uh, just, just, just told me, it was, he was so clear on a specific night, on this day, we lived in Hawaii. He said, I want you to step into the light and be fully known by your spouse. And I was like, no way. And I was talking to a guy uh, who, who encouraged me. And he goes, the enemy's got nothing on you, right? You could be fully known. And so this one night, I went, it was like midnight at, at night, and, and I was pacing. And I told Jenna, I said, I have to, I have to go uh, walk the dogs. She's like, walk the dogs? It's midnight. And when I took the dogs for a walk, I looked up into the sky, I looked up into the heaven, and I was like, Lord, I want you to give me everything I need to confess because I only want to do this once. I only want to cry once for this. And out of left field, God brought two other things to my mind that I had forgotten about, and I put my fingers in my ears, and I was like, no, I'm not talking about that. And I was like, I guess you want me to be free, Lord. Four things, it's going to be heavy. So I walk in, it's like two in the morning now. And I said, babe, um, our whole marriage, I've, I've, I've been in um, bondage to fear, but that ends tonight. And one by one, one, two, three. And if you want to know those details of that story, let's grab a cup of coffee. I'll tell you the whole thing. I got no shame, no problem. I've been set free. But for that night, one, two, three, four. You know what her response was? Well, she caught her, she, she got it, caught her breath and she goes, I guess it's my turn. And I felt like the mingling of souls happened that night where we crossed this line into kind of known to fully known. Uh, we were, uh, a Jenna and I were traveling on a trip in Indiana in 2018 or 19. We, were on, we turned on the radio and there's a song by Torn Wells called Fully Known. Anybody heard that song? It's an amazing song. And as soon as we heard this song, and it goes, fully known. And love by you. And, and we said, that's our song. That's our song. If you're 99% known, you're not known. And in fact, if you're 99% known, I'm talking about in a marriage context or in a friendship context or, or, or whatever your community is, but in a marriage specifically, if you're 99% known, you're not known. And if you're 99% known, you actually prevent yourself from being loved. Because by saying, if I give you this 1%, you probably won't love me anymore. So I'm going to hold this 1%, and then now you're not loved. Jesus can't be kind of our Savior, family. When he's fully my Savior, I stepped into this thing, and I said, 
if you're true, if you're real, then I'm going to be okay when I do this. And I stepped into this realm of being fully unknown. All these roots came out, and like, and like clockwork, ministry was booming like it never had before. We had people showing up on our doorstep. We had a gal that called us and said, let me be careful. Uh, she needed us, okay? She's like, I need you guys right now. We're, we're going to be right there. We're picking you up right now. You can sleep on our couch. It just kept happening over and over because we were set free and, and the gates were open unhindered now. The more and more I have of these, the more cluttered my mind will be. When I cleared all this out, my mind sounded like this. It's totally clear. It's totally clear. Really quick, I'll show you what, what, what God gave me in another, as, as this thing started to, to uh, develop. Um, in Deuteronomy, you've heard in, in Hebrews, it talks about, uh, some, some versions say uh, a bitter root. When I looked at the word in the original language, it's, it's not really a, a, a root of bitterness. It's a root that leads to bitter fruit. And that comes from, from Deuteronomy 28. But uh, so if, there's this, if I'm believing a lie about God or about the word or about truth, then it'll manifest into these four bricks. I think that's the next slide here. Yes, four bricks. And these four bricks are guilt, anger, greed, and jealousy. Now, all of these four bricks, I, I define in what I call debt-debtor language. You know what debt-debtor language is? It's like somebody owes somebody something. So these all have to do with bitterness. Here's the lie, and then the bitterness manifests into these bricks. And if I keep building these bricks around me, then no one's going to be able to see my heart or get in, and I'll be completely isolated. And isolation is not the worst thing we do, but it is how we do the worst thing things so guilt says this i did something wrong i owe me i did something wrong i owe me i can't believe that and i keep beating myself up and guilt turns to shame guilt says i did something wrong shame says i am wrong i'm a bad person anger says you did something wrong mike you did something wrong to me you owe me i'm angry at you because you owe me uh, greed says the world did me wrong. My work did me wrong. They owe me. They owe me. Jealousy is looking at God and saying, you owe me, God. Why did you make me five foot one? I want to be tall like Jared, you know, or whatever. Uh, one time in Oceanside, we were locked out of my grandma's house. And um, guess who got us in the house? They put me through the window. You know, it was like a small window in this and I found my calling in life. So <laughs> I don't need to be jealous. Now, the antidote to all these things is forgiveness. The passage that you would want to look at to, talk, to, to get the definition of forgiveness is Matthew 18, 23 through 27. And then in summary, Jesus is saying there's a servant who owed a lot of money to this one guy. And the king said, yeah, I'm going to wipe that slate clean. It was millions and millions of dollars. And that same servant who was just forgiven, the debt was canceled, he went to another guy who owed him a fraction of that, and he started to choke him out. And Jesus says here, uh, this is Jesus' definition of forgiveness. Um, canceling the debt. Okay? 33, and you should not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you. And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. 35, and so my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. To forgive someone means you take their debt and you, you rip it. And you say, you owe me nothing anymore. So the, if you're feeling guilty from something you've done, the antidote to guilt is confession. I did this. And then it's gone. First John 1, now you go right into thanksgiving. The antidote to anger, you owe me, is forgiveness. I cancel your debt. You don't owe me a thing. Jesus paid for it, and he left the tip, so it's pretty awesome. There's nothing left for me to do. The antidote to greed, the world owes me, generosity. 
if you want to get rid of this brick in your life, so to generosity. Sometimes your body follows your heart. So if you said, you know, I'm going to give this much because giving is an act of worship, boom, and it's direct deposit so that I forget about it. Sometimes your heart will follow and you'll start to become a more of a generous person. Uh, jealousy, if you're looking at God saying, why couldn't I have different color hair, skin? Why couldn't I be born into a different socioeconomic status? Why was I in this tax bracket? Why am I not this smart? Why am I not? And then it goes on and on and on. The antidote to jealousy is thanksgiving. Thank you, God, for who you are in me. And thank you for who I am in you. And you might need help with this thing, right? Like, this is all communal. None of this stuff was meant to be done on our own. So in my life, I can list five guys who are in my life who know me. Not kind of know me. They know me. And I'm not afraid to be known by them because I can't afford any roots in my life. I can't afford any bricks. So I give them a call. Hey, Andy. I'm back at it again, man. Andy would say, thanks for sharing, brother. Let's do this. Let's confess it. And so a lot, a lot of the guys in my life, Matt, Andy, Jared, um, Chad, Nicholas, all these guys, they know how to grab shovels. I'm like, let's start digging, bro. Boom. Start digging. Oh, did you know this one was here? Gosh, I forgot about that one. And they keep digging. Boom. It's all exposed. Um, I send my friend Darius a text, and he'll send back, exposed and closed, brother. Exposed and closed. My friend Bill goes, man, this is kind of fun. Like, I'm confessing all my, this is fun. Like, this stuff has no more power over me anymore. I'm like, that's right. I get goosebumps thinking about that. He's like, this is fun. Um, Beth Moore, she goes, uh, freedom is more addictive than bondage. And when you switch it, you'll say, why, would, why did I ever choose this stuff? Jesus is way more addictive than all this other stuff. So I also might need to call my friends to bring a hammer and to bust these things up. And just when you thought it was over, there are other things here. We added these ones. I'll just show this briefly. See, these, these are wounds on the tree. There's different types of wounds. Fear wounds. Anger wounds. Deceit wounds. Shame wounds. And sadness or loss. I think all you have to live is about five years of life. I'm talking about from zero to five. Before you start to experience some wounds that, that occur in life. W whether... Whether you lost a parent early on, whether, whether you had an unloving parent, um, whether you experienced something at school, whether there was some sort of trauma, these things will mark us. And John Eldridge said it, it's, the worst thing that happens to us is not, is not our past, but it's not doing anything, not doing anything about it. There's a saying that if, if you don't heal what hurt you, you'll, you'll bleed all over those who didn't cut you. And so God has provided the church as a vehicle in the kingdom of God to provide healing for all these things that happen. Now, who, who can agree with me that life is kind of messy? Like, look at all the stuff that could happen. This is early on. Never been in a counseling case where someone didn't need to go back to the time that they were a young kid and, and have to release or forgive something that happened in the past, whether it was a wound or release something that they learned there's, there's, there's a part of the book where I talk about weeds that, that grow up and choke out the tree. I mean, generational patterns in the families, kind of bad habits that we have learned from our family members that have been passed down because they didn't know any better. They just learned it and they learned it. But at some point, someone in the generational fam family lineage has to say, I'm standing up and we're breaking this curse right now. No more whether anger was passed down from father to father, we have the Holy Spirit who says, nope, that ends right now. And then the enemy loses. And God says, awesome. Uh, there's so much more. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it up here uh, because this is so, like how are we supposed to do this? This can be so discouraging. But God has given us the body of Christ to do this together. We are not created as an island. No man is an island. 
No woman is an island. We are called to do this together. Confession and repentance in the midst of community, which ties into our vision, 2020 vision at, at Heritage, to experience the power, uh, the presence of God and the power of family. It's a, it's a communal vision statement. What is freedom uh, in, according to the Bible? So last verse here. Turn to 2 Corinthians 3.17. 2 Corinthians 3.17. If you want to know the Bible's definition of freedom, it's this. Paul speaking to probably one of the most jacked up churches in all of scripture, the Corinthians, who had a lot of these issues going on. A lot of fruit, a lot of roots. He says this, now where the spirit, now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom is not the absence of something, but rather the presence of someone. If you have the Holy Spirit in you, you are completely free. I'm not saying you don't have a, a, a jerk boss or a, a pesky neighbor or an angry spouse or wayward kids or those things can all be present and you have freedom. Why? Because where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And I don't need to react to any of those things because I'm free. And I don't need to have any of these things manifest into fruit in my life because I'm free to confess. I don't have to walk around and operate out of my wounds because I'm free to receive the healing that God has for me in the midst of community. The stuff that Jesus paid for. And sometimes Jesus is just like, Give them, give them to me. I paid for those. Give, give them to me. You don't, that sin doesn't belong to you. Confess it. Give it to me. As, as the band comes up, um, they're going to lead us in, in a time of, of worship through music. And uh, the prayer team is going to be standing by here to the side. If, if, if there's something on your heart, and if I know God, he's delivered here today. And he showed you ways where you're operating out of your wounds or, or believing lies or isolating and it's manifested into, into bad behavior. We ask you to bring that to the Lord and, and we're going to join it hip together. We're not saying do this alone. We're saying let's do this together. Let's struggle well together because where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom.